Software Engineering Year 11 course Unit 1, Programming Fundamentals. So we're going to take a look at the first unit of the Year 11 course. And if you take a look at the syllabus on this course, it's actually the most comprehensive unit in relation to terminology. It has the most points and you'll see that illustrated here in this mind map. But pretty much this is an introduction to programming itself and a lot of those basic ideas that come along with it and a lot of this is transferred across from the original software design and development course so let's get started and firstly looking at software development itself and here we're going to like take a look at concepts of online code collaboration tools the fact that we do have online platforms now where code can be developed with teams and by using a platform they can all be working on the same files at once and then the other element we're going to look at is that of fundamental steps in developing software. So steps we go through traditionally when we're developing programs. The fact that we have to define our requirements, what outcomes we want to see. Then determining specifications, what needs to be done in order to achieve a successful program. The design, how it's going to look. The development, what steps will we take in order to achieve the solution. Integration, testing and debugging, okay, ensuring that what we create is working and fits into the context that we want it to work in when an end user is going to access it. Installation, relating to how the actual software will be installed on systems. And then maintenance, how the software will be maintained over the long term when it is lies live and in effect and being used by users. So that's the first area of software development. The next area is that of designing algorithms, the procedures that allow us to establish how programs are going to work and essentially planning tools that start off the programming process. So first we look at the idea of computational thinking, thinking like a computer, although computational thinking is used out of the realm of programming as well, because it is great for procedural thinking. But here, as the, this section already says, we concentrate on the algorithms representing our computational thinking, going through projects step by step in a logical order in order to achieve a solution. In doing this, we use what's known as control structures, which allow for our algorithms to break away from their linear structure. Sequence actually being that linear structure, but then selection where we can go down two actual strands or many strands and make a logical decision within our programs. And then iteration, the use of repetition within specific steps of our program. And then the other element of computational thinking is that of identifying the data that will likely be used in our program. What type of data will this program need and need to be entered by users in order for it to process correctly and then provide meaningful information back to that same user. So that's what identifying data is all about. The next step then is algorithmic design strategies. So ways we can approach developing algorithms. And if we think about a program, it's not just one algorithm that will solve the entire program. Usually we're using multiple algorithms to create larger programs, larger scale programs that do many things. So two strategies here are that of divide and conquer, where we break an actual program into its sub programs and approach it all as mini little programs to make the whole process a bit easier to map out logically. And then backtracking where we use an incremental approach to or in order to solve a problem. The next area then is structuring algorithms and we have two main areas here that of pseudocode which is a text-based code-like language which we write out in order to plan the structure of our algorithm in logical order that is similar to code but not an actual programming code thus making it adaptable to many types of programming languages if we do decide to go ahead with coding this actual algorithm. The other format is that of a flowchart, which is a visual way of representing an algorithm, making use of symbols, okay, of squares to represent processes and diamonds to represent decisions and repetition, and then arrows to show the flow of data through the actual algorithm. So it's more of a visual way and sometimes can paint a clearer picture of the logic of an algorithm and how it works to those who are not as familiar with code. The next area then is the programming paradigms, which can be used in conjunction with each other in order to solve actual programming problems. So the first one is that of object orientation, that we program specific objects on screen, such as buttons and drop downs menus and icons and all of that, which can be programmed all to do their own different sub programs. 
than the imperative approach using statements to solve problems. And then the functional uh, paradigm, where we're actually looking at using mathematical-like equations to do the calculations and processing of our actual program. And then the logical paradigm, where we are actually ensuring that the sequence of our steps within our actual program make logical sense. So we might have a range of statements that all should do their things correctly, but unless they're in the correct logical order, the program is not going to work. We then need to talk about flowing on from there, logic and structure of an actual algorithm. So what is the actual purpose of what we're developing? What are we trying to solve? And does this algorithm solve it? We need to look at areas where specifically inputs are coming from users and then what output are we giving back to them as information to ensure that it's satisfying their needs. We look at checking methods such as desk checks and peer checks as a way of determining if there are errors within a, an actual algorithm. And in the peer checking method, it's our peer doing the checking as well and working with us. And then making connections between data, input, process and output, which can be supported by a range of thinking strategies. Okay, and then we've got our modeling tools, ways of diagrammically representing what our actual program could look like. So the first one is that of structure charts for showing an overall system and the an actual program and how modules are connected to one another. We have abstraction for adapting ideas and using ideas that are in existence and then refinement diagrams for ensuring that we're on the right track with what we're doing and trying to simplify and finalize the design process. The next theory then is data for software engineering. Data being extremely key in the relation to developing programs because essentially that's what users are going to be putting into our system and ultimately that's what is required by a system in order to produce the information that the users are after out of using specific programs. So firstly, we're looking at different number systems for the types of data that will be on this system, either to simplify or be to use in specific contexts. That of a binary, which is base two, decimal that is base 10, or hexadecimal, which is base 16, all used in different contexts within a system. The next area then is actually representing integers, okay, and especially in units of two here as well. There's a focus there on how they are appearing within a system that we need to understand in this stage of the actual unit. Then we take a look at data types and the data types is how data will be understood by a program in order for it to be processed correctly. So the first one is that of char or character and string, okay, which is used for symbolic data, words or symbols such as letters, numbers that are not numeric, and then your exclamation marks, hashtags and all that. They could all fall in the character string area. We then have Boolean, which is used to represent data that will be in one of two states, such as yes or no, or on and off. Then we have integers that does recognize whole numbers as actual numbers and can be used for mathematical equations. But then that can be broken down into the two underneath as well, where we have real numbers, which can represent fractional numbers or irrational numbers, like the square root of two or something like that, which are not incomplete numbers and may have decimal points that go on infinitely, such as pi. And then floating point numbers, which can be used to represent decimal numbers. And then, with a very, which is very useful, date and time as a structure, okay, that recording the current date and time from the system, so you can actually timestamp parts of our program when in effect. The next area then is the use of data dictionaries for establishing the data that's going to be used within our program. So establishing the aforementioned data types we just spoke about, structuring data into a format that we want it to appear as. So date and time can be structured in a variety of ways, depending on what part of the world you're in or the context it's going to be used. And then also establishing the relationships between data and different data types within a program. And then we have our data structures, all right, which can be used for putting together uh, large amounts of data together. So arrays and which we'll talk about later on uh, in this actual mind map and how they can structure data in different ways. Records, which can be used in conjunction with databases where data can be kept about specific fields within a database and can actually have those field headings appear in our actual program. Trees for showing the breakdown of data and used in different ways. And then finally sequential files, which can be searched through and used in order, and then we can request it from the order it's in, in order to retrieve data in that format. The final area of this unit is that of developing solutions with code. And as you can see, it's the culmination of what we've done now. We are actually now putting the program together. So first we have that computational thinking and programming skills now being used together in order to start creating the code. So initially we got used computational thinking to 
create our ideas and put it into theory and an algorithm. Now we need to turn that algorithm into actual code and code depending on what platform we're using. Are we using Python? Are we using Visual Basic? Are we using C++? So hopefully if we did it in pseudocode, that should be an easy transition in order to turn that into code for our function. Where are the control structures within our program? How do we embed them into it? Our sequence, our selection and repetition. The use of data structures, which we just spoke about, and I'll mention again in the next point. The use of standard modules, so specific modules or programs that we have already in existence, so that we're not always reinventing the wheel. Where can I use my pre-existing modules within this program in order to speed up the design process? And then where can I create new sub-programs that are part of my program? What am I going to focus on? And then how do I bring all my sub-programs together? The next point then is back to data structures and it's in the context of supporting storage. So the use of single or multi-dimensional arrays, a single array, which is just one row of different forms of data and multi-dimensional uh, arrays where you have an X and Y axis where you have a grid of data that we can request from through referencing uh, points of the X and Y axis. The use of lists for storing data, the use of trees for storing data as well, and stacks, okay, which can all be used in different ways to store data within a system, as well as hash tables as well. So how these different structures can be used specifically for storage, and then obviously being able to be a user requesting data from the system, how that is done by the program, how it indexes it, and calls it back for a user to see. We then have project management models. And here we have two contrasting models. The waterfall model, which involves structured steps that are followed in order, one stage flowing into another and following that structure in order to solve the problem. So the first stage of understanding the problem and what the actual issues are. And then obviously the designing stage where we start putting our actual project together. Then we have an actual producing stage where we actually build the solution. And then a testing evaluation stage where we ensure that the project's needs were met. So that is done in a specific order in order to solve a problem. This differs from the agile method, which is very spontaneous and involves teams working on different parts and really kind of going with the flow, though still having regular meetings, but really using an iterative approach in that they develop a piece of the problem and they implement it straight away. And then they work on another part of the project. And then once that's done, they include that in the solution with the initial part they already finished and then update that original part to include each other, the two parts that are finished, and then they might work on a third part. So a very spontaneous approach, high levels of teamwork, but not as much structure as the waterfall model. But obviously, because you're releasing the system in parts, it's very quick. And that's what it's meant to be very quick. And they use a logic known as sprints in order to complete parts very quickly and get things out quickly to an actual client. Another stage then, as mentioned with the waterfall model, but obviously it is included in both methods, is that of testing and evaluating, ensuring that the program we've developed is working as expected and meeting the initial needs. So we have things known as functionality testing, so that the actual system, the actual code is working as it should be. Then performance testing, which not just relates to code, but code working with the hardware of a system. Is the working effectively? Is the integrity dropping at certain points because the code is not working as it should be? And then that brings us to the third point of code reliability, impacting on although the code is correct, is it causing lag within the system or are false outcomes coming out of the system? And remember, if a system produces uh, poor information, no one's going to want to use that system. And then the final point of documentation, the paperwork, whether digital or in um, physical format in a booklet, that supports the usage of the system. Because essentially, once this program's out there on the market, we don't want people ringing us up as the developer asking us how to use it. No, we want to have documentation released with our program that supports their use of the program and ensures that they understand how to use it. And if they don't understand something, they can refer to that documentation in order to understand it correctly. Documentation can also be intrinsic and internal within a program too. So the programmers know what's going on within a program supporting the development process. Then we have just understanding errors and what we're using to ensure that errors are addressed within a program. And we obviously need to put in fail safes and specific lines of code that help work around errors because many things can make a program crash. And then one such area that supports this is that of debugging tools. So ensuring that we are checking a program for bugs using a variety of different uh, types of methods here, that of breakpoints, single line stepping, watches, 
interfaces between functions when we draw them together, debugging output statements so we can actually see what the feedback is from hardware and from code when we're actually running a program, and then debugging software in general, which is commonplace in um, interactive development environments, giving us feedback on how the code is executing and where errors may be occurring. So I hope this video has given you an understanding of this first unit of the software engineering course, that of the programming fundamentals. There isn't much new here in relation to the changes between the old syllabus and the new syllabus, but there is a lot here. This is the most content heavy section of the year 11 syllabus. So there is a lot of terminology, a lot of diagrams, a lot of logic, and a lot of understanding of programming, as the name suggests, to be understood here. But hopefully this helps you map it out logically in your head, what areas need to understand whether for exam purposes or just trying to get your head around your understanding of the programming fundamentals to become a better programmer yourself.